Beloved, I'm going to start off in Luke 21. It'll take us just a second. We're doing the purpose of the tribulation, and we'll see what we'll do. Come back when we walk through the book of Revelation. We'll definitely see the tribulation period that we're talking about. But the tribulation is going to be a time of uniqueness. But thought that we would do it this way as we head over to Luke 21. The Mosaic Covenant we've already seen in Leviticus 26, 40 through 45, the Mosaic Covenant promises the eventual return of the nation of Israel to the same land that they're exiled from. God didn't say how many times he was going to do that. But in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, as part of the curse of the blessing of the curse, God promised the nation of Israel if you do not return, he says later on, I sent you prophet after prophet after prophet from morning till evening calling out to you and you did not return that finally the exile is getting ready to take place. Now what a lot of people don't realize is that the people, not talking about the books, but the people of Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel knew each other. They were all probably good friends. You're not going to have that much of a righteous remnant left. But all of them would have been in Jerusalem about the same time, and all of them are affected or were affected when the exile finally came. The ten northern tribes spun off, and they were a kingdom unto themselves. Not one king sat on David's throne. Not one king had Davidic covenant promises. And not one good king for the ten northern tribes. That's the one that Assyrian took uh, into exile. That's the one that Jonah went to, didn't want to go to Nineveh. The, the nation, the ten northern tribes didn't go out of existence because they migrated down to the southern tribes. So you still got the twelve tribes together. But Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. Now, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon is getting ready to knock on the door big time with this. And Babylon is getting ready to take the nation into exile, and they do it in three different deportations. In 605 BC, Daniel is taken to Babylon. So when you open up Daniel 1, we're not going there, but when you read Daniel 1, he's among the exiles. He is there in Babylon. He is part, uh, he, he did not, he walked with God, let's put it this way, and yet he got caught up in the exile part. So Daniel is, starts off in 605 going into exile. In 597 B.C., Ezekiel ended up going into exile, into Babylon as well. Ezekiel 1 opens up with Ezekiel being among the exiles. And Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, Bless his heart, Jeremiah had to be there to see the rape, the pillage, the murders. Jeremiah is there before the fall of Jerusalem. Jeremiah is there after the fall of Jerusalem. Jeremiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes Lamentations. Lamentations laments the murders, the rapes, the killing, the sacking of the city of Jerusalem. And the temple is destroyed as well. Now, while we're doing this in Luke chapter 21, if you want to mark your Bibles, the last part of verse 24, Luke 21, verse 24. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. And here's another one of those untils that we have seen in Scripture. Jerusalem's going to be trampled underfoot by Gentiles. Until, until what? Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now the phrase, the times of the Gentiles did not come forth until Jesus said it. But 586 BC starts the times of the Gentiles. Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple is destroyed. But even more so with this, nobody sits on David's throne after 586 BC. So it's the times of the Gentiles. Do we still see Jerusalem trampled underfoot? You betcha. They have a pagan mosque on place of the Temple Mount. That pagan mosque is a Gentile mosque. And so Jerusalem's going to be trampled underfoot. We saw with the New Covenant with, in Jeremiah 31, 
38 through 40 that when the fullness of the new covenant comes in, Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt for the Lord and never again plucked up or overthrown anymore forever. And so we're going to see with Ezekiel, I'm turning over to Ezekiel chapter 1. We're going to see with this how this begins and start implementing what we have seen from Scripture, from some of God's promises. And I think you'll see the book unfold in front of you. Look how chapter 1 starts. Now it came about in the 30th year on the 5th day of the 4th month. While I was by the river Chabar, and look at this expression, among the, gen, among the exiles. So we know that he is in ex, he's been exiled to Babylon. Now, you may be wondering why that, you know, what does this have to do with the tribulation period? And we're going to see it has a whole, whole lot to do with the tribulation period. Because part of this is we need to back up and look at this. What's the purpose of the tribulation for the Jews and what's the purpose of the tribulation for the Gentiles? And we're going to start with the purpose of the tribulation for the, Jew, for the Jews and see it in the book of Exodus. If we had time, we would go through chapter 1 because Ezekiel sees a vision of the glory of God. And he's always using the word like. Worse than a California girl uses it in a paragraph. Using the word like. <sighs> There was something like a wheel. There was something like wheels within wheel. There was something like glowing metal. There was something like creatures. It's something like in chapter 1. But he ends by saying, the last part of verse 28, such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of my Lord. So he gets to see what the glory of the Lord looks like. He got to see, we'll put it this way, what Peter, James, and John saw briefly on Jesus' face at the Mount of Transfiguration. Only this is a little bit fuller description, but it is a vision. Now, when we come to chapters 8 through 11, the, they've already exiled. And this, this is from a Babylonian perspective. But Ezekiel is taken in a vision from, from Babylon to the temple. And God shows him all the terrible things that are being done in the temple. And God is getting ready to judge the Jewish people. What he does in chapters 8 through 11, we don't have time to go there, but you can follow through. In three different stages, he removes his glory from his temple. He goes up from the Holy of Holies, he goes to the edge, goes to the threshold. The last thing he does is the glory of God goes over the Mount of Olives. And you can read it in there. But just before the glory is removed, look at the promise that God has. Chapter 11, starting in verse 14 with this. Here's what God says. Then the Lord, to me, the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, your brothers, your relatives, your fellow exiles, the whole house of Israel, all of them, are those to whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Go far from the Lord. This land has been given to us as a possession. Now, when this is written, remember, Jeremiah is in Jerusalem, but Ezekiel's in exile. Jerusalem has not been taken, operative word, yet in this section of Ezekiel. We're going to see that during Ezekiel's ministry, they're going to get word that Jerusalem has fallen. So when this takes place, the temple's still there, the priesthood's still there. God removes his glory, and nobody asks him not to go God removes his glory, and all you have is just a little frame of a place for the temple because the real power and glory has departed. But they're saying as far as that this land has been given to us for a possession. Well, yes, it has, but also the Mosaic Covenant under which they are tells them to be obedient to Yahweh or God will eventually exile them. So he says in verse 16, Therefore, thus says the Lord, Though I had removed them far among the nations, and though I had scattered them among the countries, yet I was a sanctuary for them for a little while in the countries where they go. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I shall gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries among which you have been scattered, and I shall give you the land of Israel. This is before they go into exile. He promises that he is going to give them the land of Israel back 
When they come there, they will remove all of its detestable things and all of its abominations. Look at verse 19. This is new covenant language without the words new covenant mentioned. I shall give them one heart and I shall put a new spirit within them. I shall take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a a heart of flesh. Verse 20, they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. Then they will be my people and I shall be their God. By the way, since we're there, verses 22 and 23, then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them and the glory of God of Israel hovered over them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood over the mountain which is east of the city. That's the Mount of Olives. This is the last time that the glory of God is mentioned in the Old Testament. This is the last appearance of the glory of God in the Old Testament. The glory of God does not show up again until there were shepherds in the same field abiding. There were shepherds in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, them, appeared before them and glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were terribly afraid. And so <laughs> ties in with the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll move on to other parts. Just working through the book, then we have to leave out sections. Chapter 16. So before the exile really kicks in, here's one of the things God promises. Chapter 16, verses 60 through 63. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your sisters, both your older and your younger, and I'll give them to you as daughters, but not because of your covenant. Thus, I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord in order that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your humiliation when I have forgiven you for all that you have done, declares the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, that doesn't sound like God has completely abandoned this particular people. Judge them severely, you bet. Promise to bring them back, same way, you bet. Now, with this, as we work our way through, if you mark your Bibles or the persons beside you's Bibles, just reach over in the general area and mark it and I'll call you blessed. Chapter 20, verse 33. We're going to read this verse with biblical eyes based off what we see. Here's part of the purpose of the tribulation. As I live, chapter 20, verse 33, as I live, declares the Lord God, Surely with a mighty hand and with outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, look at this, I shall be king over you. When Jesus is presented to the Jewish people, they say we have no king but Caesar. When they say let his blood be upon us and upon our children, that is a temporary rejection to their own calamity and their own eternal damnation unless they receive them later. But God says, as I live with, surely with a mighty hand and outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, the Davidic covenant promise, I shall be king over you. Now this is also the Davidic covenant promise that the root and the offspring of David is also going to be the God who reigns over the people. So God is going to do this to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what else he says in reference to this. Verse 34, I shall bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. We're going to come back to this in Revelation and with wrath poured out. Wrath of God is going to play a very important part in the book of Revelation. So I'm going to bring you out from the peoples with wrath poured out, verse 35. Then look what he says. I shall bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I shall enter into judgment with you face to face. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. Look what he says in verse 37. I will make you pass under the rod. That's not a good thing. It's a good thing as it relates to their ultimate uh, salvation. But it's a very painful thing. 
God is going to judge the Jewish people severely, bring them under the rod, but also with this, I shall bring you, verse 37, into the bond of the covenant. This is the new covenant that he's going to bring them into bond. And I shall purge from you all the rebels and those who transgress against me. I shall bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but I will not let them enter the land of Israel. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. All right, as for you, verse 39, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, go serve everyone as idols. But later you will listen to me, surely listen to me. And my holy name you will profane no longer with your gifts and with your idols. For God says, verse 40, for on my holy mountain, which it is, on the high mountain of Israel declares the Lord God, there the whole house of Israel, all of them will serve me in the land. There I shall accept them and there I shall seek your contributions and the choices of your gifts and all your holy things. Now, of course, he's going to remove those who are in rebellion against him. He's going to bring them into the rod of judgment. He's going to bring them into the bond of the covenant that he has made with them. Just take a peek, if you will. Let's look at this. Over in Ezekiel chapter, oh, chapter 33. Let's look at that one just real quickly. What to leave in, what to leave out. I thought you might like this time marker. Chapter 33, verse 21. Now it came about in the 12th year of our exile, on the 5th of the 10th month, that the refugees from Jerusalem came to me saying, and look at this, the city has been taken. Jerusalem has been destroyed. God's temple, that empty shell since he removed his glory, that temple has been destroyed. The amount of murders, the amount of rapes, the amount of pillage that went forth. They come and say Jerusalem is destroyed. That's the first time Jerusalem was destroyed with the nation of Israel being there. They no longer have a king. They don't know it yet, but the times of the Gentiles have started. And so the question comes in, what's God going to do now? Look at the next verse. Verse 22, now the hand of the Lord had been on me in the evening before the refugees came. So before the refugees came, the night before, the hand of the Lord is on Ezekiel. And he opened my mouth at that time and they came in the morning so as my mouth was open, I was no longer speechless. But what takes place is that chapters 34 through 39 is going to be what God promises to the people that he just brought into exile. These are promises to the Jewish people. And look at what he says. If you mark your Bible, what to leave in, what to leave out. I hope you get a chance to read this sometime. Chapter 36, verse 22. If you mark your Bible, here we go. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And look what God says in verse 23. Then the nations, the Gentiles, will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when... I prove myself holy among you in their sight. Now look what God says in verse 24. For I will gather you, I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Now the next part we're going to come to in just one second, but this is important. God has promised that I mean, the, the immediate context was the Babylonian exile. He didn't tell them how many times he was going to exile the nation of Israel. In AD 70, the temple is destroyed for the second time on the same day, by the way. Pretty good timing, God's part. AD 7, the Romans come in and take out Jerusalem, take out the temple. The Jews are dispersed. The diaspora, the Jews are dispersed. 
they do not have their own homeland until after. This is why we're looking at the world with biblical eyes, hopefully, because we're watching world events line up. I've read prophetic books, and it's not because I'll, I'll be 60 on my next birthday if I make it to my next birthday. I'll be 60. And it's not because these things have happened in my life. I would do the same thing, just going through Scripture. Books are written by people in the 1800s, 1900s. Who cares what happens in this ancient land of Israel? Nobody's in there anymore except for just stragglers. There's nothing. Nobody wants it. And then God starts bringing people back. World War II has a very important part. Movies are starting to come out. People are starting to see news. People in Australia could find out what was taking place in other places. People in America could see this. The Holocaust played a part in this. 1948, the Jewish people come back as a nation in the same land. God says, I will bring them back. Whenever these things take place, the nation of Israel has to be back in the land but they're not going to be rightly related to Yahweh. We'll see this in other sessions kind of more clearly. What the Jewish people are going to try to do during the tribulation is bring back the Mosaic Covenant. That's the only thing they know. They're going to bring back the temple, going to bring back the sacrifices, bring back the Levitical priesthood. But God is not going to accept any of those. Why not? The blood of the new covenant has already been poured out. That's the last covenant God makes in Scripture. And the new covenant is the one that is forgiven us of sin. All through Hebrews talks about the blood of bulls and ghosts. It's impossible to take away sin. So the people are going to rebuild the new covenant. We'll get into that and see with the Antichrist and what he has to do with that. But what God says is, is that the nation of Israel has to be back in the land as a people yet not rightly related to him. If you look on the world news, on the world map, you will see the nation of Israel back in the land. Are they at peace? Are you kidding? By the way, has the time of the Gentiles in? Is Jerusalem at peace? They are crying out for somebody to bring in the world peace. Look what God says. He says, I will gather my people there. And then he says this in verse 25. Might as well do verse 24 just to get the flow. For I will take you from all the nations, gather you from all the lands, bring you into your own land. This is what happened. What other nation has ever been dispersed from its own land twice and been brought back to the same land twice? And this time they're brought back But they can't do Passover, and they can't do the Day of Atonement, and they can't do the sacrifices under the Mosaic Covenant. Now, God says, eventually, I will sprinkle. Then I will sprinkle clean water. This is New Covenant language, and you will be clean. clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart, New Covenant material, and put a new spirit, New Covenant promises within you. I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Verse 27, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you'll be careful to observe my ordinances. Then God says in verse 28, and you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers so that you will all be my people and I'll be your God Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanliness. I'll call for the grain and multiply it, and I will not bring a famine on you. Verse 30, I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field so that you may not receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds and were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities. Now, one thing that the nation of Israel has not done, and what they can't answer with this, 
Like, why the Babylonian exile? Well, you go, to, you go to Jeremiah, you go to Ezekiel, you go to Daniel. Why the Babylonian exile in 586 B.C.? You can go to 2 Kings, you can go to Chronicles, and God talks about the covenant violations that the nation of Israel did, and finally God being faithful to the exile punishment that he has. In 586 B.C., Sometime, if you want, if you get a chance, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel says, we have sinned, we and our fathers, and God has poured out the curse upon us, just as he said that he would in Scripture. Daniel says individually what the nation of Israel as a whole has not said. And here's what they cannot answer. Why? 586 B.C., idols in, the, in God's temple, temple prostitutes, all kinds of things, child sacrifice to Moloch and other gods. What they have no answer for is, all right, 586, we see why. AD 70, what did we do? There were no idols. There's no child sacrifice. We kept the Sabbath. What did we do that was so bad that God exiled us from the land? They don't have an answer. Tell you what they did. This is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased to hear him, and they didn't. They rejected the Messiah that has been given to them. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you under my wings as a hen does her chicks, and you were unhill, unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so all this time with the Holocaust or anything else, when the Jews call out to Yahweh, why? Why don't you come and rescue? Because it's still the time of the Gentiles, and they have not confessed their sin. What have we done? We haven't done anything. Kind of like the righteousness of the rich young ruler that he had, at least he thought that he had. The nation as a whole has not confessed but they're going to eventually. God says, I am going to cleanse you from all this. And then verse 32 again, similar to what he said in chapter 36, verse 22. In verse 32, he says, I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. For thus says the Lord God, on that day I will cleanse you from all your iniquities. I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places will be rebuilt. And the desolate land will be cultivated instead of being a desolate desolation in the sight of everyone who passed by. Verse 35, then they will say the desolate place has become like the Garden of Eden once the Lord returns. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. Look at verse 36, the nations that are left around you will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places. God wants credit for this. I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted which was desolate. Look at this last part, verse 36, I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. I think he means it. I think he means exactly this. I am not doing this for your own sake, O house of Israel, be ashamed. I'm doing it because you have profaned my holy name among the Gentiles. But when I cleanse you and bring you back into the land and back in the covenant obedience to me, the nations will look and know that I am God. Do you think God really means that? Now, why would anybody want to take away what God has said with us that he's going to do? His character, his quality of his own being is at stake. If he can't bring about this promise to bring about fulfillment of his word, then he's not really God. Now, he is really God, just so you'll know. But if you take away this promise, what is God trying to communicate to the nation of Israel with what he says with this? If he's not saying, I'm going to cleanse you in the future, what did he mean by saying, I'm going to cleanse you in the future? And for us, if you are saved and part of the New Testament church, you have every bit of cleansing that you will ever need to be saved. You'll have sins to confess all the days of your life to God, but as it relates to positionally, you are secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have received the Savior that the nation of Israel as a whole has not. 
Ye have received the blood sacrifice of the new covenant that the nation of the Israel, Israel as a whole has not. And so God says, I am going to do this in the future. A couple more. And we'll start winding down. Chapter 39, last part of this segment. Chapter 34, again, through 39 is one segment. It's right after the people came with word that Jerusalem had fallen. Here's what God says. In chapter... 39, starting at verse 17. As for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to every kind of bird and assemble the beast of the field. Assemble and come, gather from every side to my sacrifice, which I'm going to sacrifice for you, as a great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel, that you may eat the flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of the princes of the earth as though they were rams, lambs, goats, and bulls, all of the fatlings of Bashan. So you'll eat, you'll eat fat until you're blooded, drink blood, seek your sense of the material until you're drunk. When you come to chapter 19 of Revelation, when we come there, Revelation 19 is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the birds are called to come assemble and just eat. So this is kind of the preliminary part for this. For God says, verse 20, you are glutted at my table with the horses and charioteers and mighty men. And all the men of war declares the Lord God. When Jesus returns, it's either the best news or the worst news for people. If you are saved, it's the absolute best news that Jesus has returned. The only two options, you're either saved or you're not. You're either his child or you're not. And when he comes back, he has to get rid of his enemies. And we'll see that in Revelation 19. Now God says, the one who removes his glory in chapters 8 through 11 says, I will set my glory among the nations. For those who are here at church, previously we talked in real briefly Matthew 16 is the first time that Jesus teaches on the glory of the Lord, and he does so about the second coming. And so this is second coming information about the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll set my glory among the nations, and the nations will see my judgment, which I have executed in my hand, which I have laid on them. And the house of Israel will know that I'm the Lord their God from that day onward. And the nations will know that the house of Israel went into exile for their iniquity because they acted treacherously against me. And I hid my face from them. So I gave them into the hand of their adversaries, and all of them fell by the sword. According to their uncleanliness and according to their transgressions, I dealt with them, and I hid my face from them. Therefore, here's how that section, chapters 34 through 39, ends. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will restore the fortunes of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel, and I shall be jealous for my holy name. And they shall forget their disgrace and all their treachery which they perpetrated against me. And when they live securely in their own land with, with no one to make them afraid. Now remember the times of the Gentiles, Jerusalem's going to be trampled underfoot until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled, Luke 21, 24. So this would be the fulfillment of the times of the Gentiles are going to live in their own land, verse 27. When I bring them back from the peoples and gather them from the lands of their enemies, then I shall be sanctified through them in the sight of any nations. Verse 27 has not happened yet. They are not sanctified. He's not sanctified in the eyes of many nations because of what he's done. Verse 28, then they will know that I am Yahweh, their God, because I made them go into exile among the nations and then gathered them again to their own land. And I'll leave none of them there any longer. And I will not hide my face from them any longer. For I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. So what we see, if these are the last of the last days, we see the nation of Israel as a nation, but not in covenant obedience to Yahweh. We see God's character, his own person at stake. He has said, I am going to do all this. Now he's done the preliminary part. 
The UN will take credit for it or other people will take credit for it. God's the one that says, I'll gather the people back. He can use human means to do that if he wants to. Now, part of the purpose of the tribulation for the Jewish people, we need to peek at Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. Here's what he says. Now, Zechariah would be during the times of the Gentiles. Nobody has sat on David's throne. Zechariah 12, 10 says, God says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they'll mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. They'll weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping of the firstborn. When you go back and read Isaiah 53, that's what they're going to do. They're going to mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. They're going to understand that Jesus was given to them by God and they did not receive him. Chapter 13, verse 1, in that day a fountain will be opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and impurity. If you're saved, you don't need that fountain. If you're unsaved, you do, and it's the same fountain that we have received in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not another death, of course. It's the same death that Jesus did, the same fountain for our cleansing. But in chapter 13, verse 7, I thought you might like to note this. At the rest of Jesus in Matthew 26, verse 31, they quote the first part of this. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man my associate, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered. And I'll turn my little hand, I'll turn my hand rather against the little ones. This is fulfilled in Matthew 26, 31. He quotes this. Now, this is the first part that is already fulfilled at the arrest of Jesus. Here's the part that has not been fulfilled, operative word yet, verse 8 and 9. And it will come about in all the land, declares the Lord. Two parts of it will perish. Here's the purpose of the tribulation for the Jewish people. Two parts of it will perish. And the third part will be left. And look what God says. He says, I, throughout here, I will bring the third part of the Jewish remnant. I'll bring the one third of the Jewish people. I will bring the third part through the fire. That's tough, that's hard, but he's working in their lives. Refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They, this one third Jewish remnant will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say Yahweh is my God. Now notice what happens yet, yeah, chapter 14, behold the day is coming for the Lord when the spoil is taken from among you will be divided among you. Look what God says, for I will gather all the battles, against, all the nations rather, against Jerusalem to battle. If God's going to gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, then the times of the Gentiles has not ended yet. This is the end of the times of the Gentiles. He gathers the nations. Now, this would be chapter 19 of Revelation. We'll make our way over there eventually. But here's what happens with this. The Lord, chapter 3, chapter 14, verse 3, rather. The Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. And that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem. On the east, the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle. Just for time's sake, the last part of verse 5, then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. Then look at verse 9. And the Lord will be king over all the earth in that day. The Lord will be the only one and his name the only one. Just as he has promised repeatedly. As I live, with wrath poured out, my hand extended, I will be king over you. 
He brings them into covenant obedience relation. He brings them under the rod. He brings them through the fire. Two-thirds of them are destroyed. One-third, the righteous remnant, is brought into a saving relationship with Yahweh. He becomes king. Look what takes place in chapter 14, verse 16 to 17. Don't come about that any are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up year from year to worship the king Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles. And it'll be that whichever the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, there'll be no rain on them. So this is coming up from Jerusalem year by year to come and worship the Lord. I'm going to be there. I'm going to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. Look forward to doing that. Now, for the Jewish people, this is the purpose of the tribulation, to rid two-thirds of the people who reject them, but to bring one-third in the covenant obedient relationship with them. And so you're going to find Jews in the book of Revelation. You're going to find the 12 tribes in the book of Revelation. Right, how about for the Gentiles? What's the purpose of the tribulation? Revelation chapter 3. And we'll still do a walkthrough, a, a theological walkthrough of the book of Revelation. There's a promise that's made to the church at Philadelphia. In chapter 3, starting in verse 7, right to the angel slash messenger of the church in Philadelphia. And look at this kind of easy to miss description. I hope your ears will perk up or your eyes will perk up when you see this. Here's the description. He who is holy, who is true, who has present tense the key of David. Remember he talked about in Matthew 16 the keys of the kingdom. Here's one who has present tense the key of David. That's ownership, that's possession. Now, he has not unlocked the key of David using that as a way of opening things, so to speak. He hasn't done that yet. He hasn't. He reminds the church of Philadelphia that he has the key of David. He reminded the churches in Revelation 22, he wants them to know, I am the root and the offspring of David. So he says with this, who opens and no one can shut, verse 7, and shuts and no one can open, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I put before you an open door which no one can shut because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Verse 9, behold, I will cause those who are the synagogue of Satan who say they're Jews and are not to lie. Behold, I'll make them come and bow down at your feet and to know that I have loved you. Doesn't say when that's going to take place. That may be at the great white throne judgment. We don't know. We don't know exactly with that. But all of that to get down to Revelation 3, verse 10. If you mark your Bibles, this is a good one to mark. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, God says, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. All throughout the book of Revelation, those who dwell upon the earth are unbelievers. It's used something like six times right around there. Don't quote me on that, but it's used often. Whenever you've got those who dwell on the earth, you're talking about people who are lost. Now, everybody entering the tribulation enters lost, but there are going to be saved people. There's going to be tons of evangelism done during the tribulation period. But for the Gentiles, this is the purpose of the tribulation for them. To go through this time of testing, it's going to be like any other time, unlike any other time in the history of the world. People are either going to be brought into a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ through the blood of the new covenant, or they will see him in Revelation 20 at the great white throne judgment. Some may even live through the tribulation. In fact, they will, some will live, Jew and Gentile, at Jesus' physical return to earth. But the purpose of the tribulation for the Gentiles is just that, to test them, 
to purge them, so to speak, in the same way that the Jewish people are purged. What's the purpose of the tribulation for the church? There is none. There's no purpose for the tribulation. We have already received the Savior that the Jews have not. We who are saved are already in the bond of the new covenant fellowship with the Lord. There's not one sin that we will not have forgiven by Jesus. Incredible grace poured out. There's no purpose in the Bible for the church tribulation was. There's a good reason for that. And we will see that in upcoming sessions.